Out of all of the colonies and frontiers on the American continents, the colonial Europeans found Canada to be the most challenging to settle. Despite the stereotypes that Canada is a peaceful, laid-back land, its history has been filled with challenges, controversies, and power struggles. Waves of colonization hit the shores of Canada as different European countries attempted to bring this vast land under colonial power. But their success was limited. In fact, it was so limited that there are still vast tracts of land in Canada that remain unexplored. The fight for unity has colored much of Canadian history and it still influences their governmental policy today as they continue to grow and evolve into the future. Canada was populated by Native American tribes long before the Europeans arrived. Archaeologists believe that the first tribes, which have been termed the First Nations of North America, arrived between 12 and 15,000 years ago. But most of what we know about these first people comes from oral traditions and archaeology because they did not have a system of writing. It is believed that during the last ice age, the first people arrived in Canada on the land bridge connecting Asia to North America. During the Ice Age, the sea levels were much lower because more of the water was frozen, meaning more dry land. The water rose and covered the land bridge when the ice finally melted, cutting off North America from Asia. The first tribes had interesting animals to hunt in Canada's wild forests and icy lands, like woolly mammoths, dire wolves, and ground sloths. Some historians think the early tribes hunted these animals to extinction. But other historians believe the changing climate had more of an impact on the extinction of these species. Either way, the tribes began building more complex societies as hunters and gatherers, and there is evidence that they were fishing along the western coast of Canada by 8000 BCE. By 1000 CE, the tribes near the Great Lakes were growing maize as one of their chief crops. Maize came into what is now the United States from Central America around 2000 BCE, and it slowly spread northward. One of the most prominent tribes in this area was the Iroquois. They are best described as a confederation of tribes, but they all spoke the same language and worked together to control the northeastern section of the Great Lakes, which included land as far south as modern-day Pennsylvania and Virginia, and as far north as Ontario. The Native Americans were not left alone forever, though. Soon, they had to contend with an influx of European people, beginning with the arrival of the Vikings. After Bjarni Herjolsson accidentally stumbled across a new landmass after getting lost on his way to Greenland, Leif Erikson set out to explore the area. He and his men called their new discovery Vinland, but most historians believe that they actually found the northeastern coast of North America. They spent the winter of 1000 CE in Newfoundland. Leif Erikson told the Vikings all about this new land when he returned to Greenland, and in 1004 CE, Thorvald Eriksson decided to make an expedition of his own. Thorvald was much more violent than his brother Leif, and when he stumbled across a group of nine indigenous fishermen, he attacked them and killed eight of the nine. Historians are not sure why Thorvald attacked. The fishermen did not start the fight, but the tribe didn't much care to hear Thorvald's reasons. They attacked, forcing the Vikings to hunker down in a hastily barricaded settlement. Although most of the Vikings survived the winter, Thorvald was killed by an arrow that came over the barricade walls. Other groups of Vikings had similar experiences with the tribes in Canada. The tribes were generally peaceful, even willing to engage in trade, until a member of the tribe was injured or killed. Then, the Vikings were unable to stop the wrath of the Canadian indigenous tribes. The Vikings left Canada around 1010 CE, and Canada was again left to its own devices until 1497 when the French and English began to arrive. Almost everyone has heard of Christopher Columbus, but fewer people have heard of John Cabot, who claimed Newfoundland for England in 1497. The English quickly discovered that the eastern coast of Canada was a lucrative fishing spot, especially for cod. Cabot was also looking for a quick way to reach China and India, but he had not found one by way of Canada before he disappeared in 1498. France began exploring the New World in 1524, but they wouldn't begin exploring Canadian lands in earnest until 1534, when explorer Jacques Cartier reached Newfoundland and declared the icy landscape was the land God had given to Cain. He traded with some of the local tribes, forced locals to serve his expedition as guides, and even brought some indigenous people back to France to prove he had arrived in the New World. Cartier is the explorer who officially gave Canada its name. 
he heard one of the indigenous people refer to the land as Kanata, which is the Iroquois word for settlement or meeting place, and he began using it to refer to the entire land. There were several French expeditions to Canada, but the explorers quickly learned how brutal Canadian winters could be, which put an end to many of the explorations. In the early 1600s, the French began to settle colonies, self-sufficient farming villages and trading posts, and in 1608, they built a fortified settlement called Quebec. While trying to survive Canadian winters in Quebec, the French began to make alliances with the Montagnais and the Hurons, and they found themselves involved in tribal military conflicts. The main threat came from the Iroquois, who happened to be supported by France's biggest rival, the British. France and Britain were already fighting for dominance in Canada. The area was valuable for the fur trade, and neither country was willing to give up such a vast swath of land during colonial times. British pirates were attacking French settlements and French vessels, stopping some ships before they even landed in Canada. Meanwhile, the Iroquois and the Huron continued to fight, and the Iroquois eventually defeated their rival. By the early 1650s, the Iroquois were the only powerful tribe in the region, and they did not establish friendly relations with the French. Instead, they attacked the French colonies, and the French were left without a main indigenous ally. King Louis XIV finally decided to send the colonies some help, and in 1665, he sent 1,000 troops to Canada to aid in colonization efforts. The French army marched through Canada, conquering land around the Great Lakes, and the British, French, and Iroquois signed a peace treaty in 1701. Of course, the peace treaty didn't last very long, and about 10 years later, the British attacked French-Canadian land. The fighting only lasted a few years, and the Peace of Utrecht in 1713 made France give up important territories in Canada to the British. At this point in Canadian history, the country was divided fairly equally between the French and the British. The British forced out all the French Canadians living in their territory because they did not trust them in case war broke out. And with French and British relations, war was always coming to a head. Conflict erupted again in 1754 with the French and Indian War. Many consider this war to be the North American theater of the Seven Years' War, which began two years later. At first, the French colonies did well against the British, especially because the indigenous people fought alongside the French. When the British called in the Royal Navy, Louisbourg was lost, which was the best French port in Canada. The British then marched on Quebec. It took them several months to take the city. The French were tenacious, but hopelessly outnumbered. The Treaty of Paris in 1763 marked the end of the Seven Years' War and the official end of French colonization in Canada. Unlike the previous French citizens, the French colonists now under British rule were given a lot of leniencies. They could still practice their language, religion, and culture while still maintaining the rights as other Canadians under British rule. These measures were finalized in the Quebec Act of 1774. The Quebec Act had unexpected consequences. While it did establish some peace in Canada, it riled up the 13 colonies just south of Canada, leading to the American Revolution. At first, Canada tried to remain neutral in the conflict, but the American colonists did not allow them to remain uninvolved in the conflict because they were a threat to the war effort. In the late summer to the early fall of 1775, George Washington sent troops into Canada, and although they took Montreal, they never managed to overpower Quebec. The American troops were eventually forced to retreat as reinforcements arrived from Britain. But after the colonies had won the war, some of the remaining loyalists moved to Canada, settling mostly in Nova Scotia. The conflict between Canada and the United States would continue with the War of 1812. For many reasons, including the impressment of American citizens into the British Navy, the United States and Britain were once again at war about the rights of America as a new country. The Americans believed that to attack Canada was to attack the British Empire. After all, Canada was still under British rule. But once again, the Canadians proved they were tougher than they looked. The fight for Canadian control was bloody, but the War of 1812 ended with Britain finally acknowledging the United States as an independent country. In turn, the United States finally gave up the idea of seizing land in Canada. After these wars, the 1800s were a time of economic growth for Canada. For many years, the fur industry had been the backbone of the Canadian economy, making up 75% of Canadian exports in the 1770s. By 1810, though, the fur trade was in decline, and the Canadians were forced to consider other sources of income. 
people began branching into other areas, including harvesting timber. In fact, timber had become so important that it made up 75% of Canadian exports in 1810. The problem with the growing industrialization was that it mainly happened in British Canada, and French Canadians did not appreciate being left out. Tensions finally exploded on November 23, 1837, in the Battle of St. Denis. Although the rebels won the first battle, the British Empire quickly squashed any further hints of resistance and rebellion. In 1840, the British instituted the Act of Union, where they united Upper and Lower Canada and made sure the French Canadians were not isolated. They hoped that, in time, the British ways would rub off on the French Canadians and keep out any rebellious ideas. The following years saw general growth in Canadian politics, economics, and population as people immigrated to Canada and began pushing west. Even though Canada was still under British rule, they continued to develop their own government and began participating in international events, although fighting in wars continued to be a decision of the British government. The British sent Canadian troops to fight in World War I, and the Canadian troops were instrumental in several battles. After the war, Canada technically remained part of the British Empire, even though they received even more autonomy in 1931 with the Statute of Westminster. They were allowed to run their country as they saw fit, but the British could edit the Canadian Constitution if the Canadian Parliament allowed it. With this change in foreign policy, the Canadians were finally free to interact with other countries on their own, and they made strong ties with the United States and proved instrumental to World War II and the Cold War. By the late 1960s, Canada had finally found its own culture, shaking free of the centuries of colonization and finding itself. This is probably best symbolized by the adoption of the Canadian flag in 1965. The maple leaf was as quirky, tenacious, and unique as the Canadian people. In 1982, Canada celebrated its independence from Britain. Today, although the British monarch is still seen as the ruler of Canada in the role of a figurehead, Canada is free to make its own decisions on policy. Although Canada is not finished growing, they will continue to celebrate their dual heritage and prove important to the history of the world. To learn more about Canada, check out our book, History of Canada, A Captivating Guide to Canadian History. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.